Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Daryl Arnez, and I am with Emergent Ministries located in the great city of Largo, Florida. And I had to make the statement in the chat, I feel Pentecostal tonight. <laughs> yeah, I feel Pentecostal tonight. Now, let me explain what I mean. Uh, when I say Pentecostal, see, there was a time when Pentecostals, <laughs> the, the, this is before Pentecostals uh, got real. Oh, you in Tallahassee, sis? Praise God. This, this was before Pentecostals got real formal. This is before Pentecostals got real uh, bourgeois. This is before Pentecostals were accepted by the broader community of faith and they just believed in praising God. Can I get a witness up in here? And again, I want to welcome everybody. And I thought about something. Um, I see Pastor Dawn is in here tonight and I want to bless you, sister. You, you blessed me in, in more ways than one. Uh, Sunday. You bless me in more ways than one. If anybody's not following Pastor Dawn, you really need to um, you, you really need to follow her because she is a she is a true pastor. She's she is a true pastor. You can you can hear it um, when she speaks. You can you, you can just feel that pastoral anointing um, coming through and that's always a good thing. But she said something a couple of weeks ago and I don't even know if this is how she meant it. Um, <laughs> but it stuck with me and, and I said, you know, she's right. She's absolutely right. Um, but she was making mention to some people, um, about some of my conversations about some of my broadcasts and she made the statement. She said, you know, he's, he's a, you know, he's a really good teacher you know, and he and you know he's apostolic. Now, I don't know if she meant that in terms of you know I teach apostolically or I have an apostolic um, function on my life. I'm not sure if that's how she meant it. Um, but the thing that hit me when she said it, I said, you know, she's actually right. <laughs> I am apostolic. Um, and I'm starting. I'm, I'm. I'm starting to understand this, right? And when I talk about being apostolic, I'm not talking about from the standpoint of some of what we think about being apostolic or being apostles or being apostolic. But I'm actually apostolic in my faith. I don't know if if you all have picked up on that, but. Um, I just don't have the legal baggage that I carry along with me. <laughs> I don't I don't have the I don't I don't have the legal religious baggage um that so often comes from uh people when they say that they're part of the apostolic faith, right? That they're part of the apostolic faith. Um because I do believe in fact that there is only one God. <laughs> I, I, I do. I really believe there's only one God um, who manifested himself in the person of the Lord Jesus um, and is manifesting himself now in the in, in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, but I am apostolic. I believe in following the apostles doctrine. I believe in the power. Oh, my. <laughs> I believe in the power. Uh, of the name of Jesus. I just want y'all to know. So I want people to understand where I'm coming from. So if you all start hearing some shifting or seeing some shifting beginning to take place um, in, in my presentation of the gospel and some of the things that I talk about and some of the ways that I dig out the text, um, you, 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 can, you, you can know that's the reason, right? I've been talking to people um, about some major areas where the Father has really been dealing with me um, about. And that's one of the areas is really, is really dealing with the, the, the true nature of God um, and not dealing with it from a, a, a philosophical, theological perspective. Um, but understand truly what Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? If you've seen me, uh, you've seen <laughs> Glory to God. You've seen 
the father. But what I want to talk to you about, I want to talk to you about um, a subject, and I'm going to try not to be real long, but I'm going to let, I'm going to let God have his way. I'm going to let the Spirit of God do what the Spirit of God does. And I want to say that this has been a really, really great day for me today, right? Um, I mean, really. I don't know if you've ever had those days where, you know, you've just, you know, communed, you know, you've just communed with the Father and, you know, you spent some time listening to the voice of God. You spent some time in worship and I've just been listening to all kind of great worship music just reminding me of just how great our God is. Glory to God. And and one and one of the things that um, the Father was sharing with me um, is that since I'm kind of coming into a, a renewed understanding, can I talk to y'all for just a little bit? Now that I'm coming into a renewed understanding of exactly who God is in my life and remembering what God has done in my life. You know, if you don't believe I've been redeemed, just follow me down uh, to the Jordan stream. I stepped in the water and it chilled, <laughs> it might have chilled my soul, but the Holy Ghost, my God, <laughs> the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost. Um, but, but anyway, um, one of the things that, that I really prayed um, today because I knew that I was coming on. I said, Father, you know, really, what I want, what I want for my brothers and sisters um, to experience in, in, in this conversation, I don't want them to just get more knowledge, but Father, I want them to, I want them to have a renewed sense of your presence in them and among them. Father, I want the spirit of the Lord Jesus to rest upon them. I want them to walk away with an assurance that Jesus is alive, with, with an assurance that you, you, you have them in the palm of your hand. Holy Spirit, I want you to, to minister to my brothers and sisters. I want you to use this broken vessel to just flow and to just touch your people so that we can experience the transformation that you long for us as your people to experience that was my prayer and I believe God's going to honor it um, one other thing that I that I thought was real unique y'all y'all might appreciate this I gotta I gotta get this out so that I can get into the word but if, if any of you heard the, the conversation I did a couple of, of days ago, or may have been last week, where I talked about for the sake of the body, part one, um, when I was talking about that, for the sake of the body, and I was talking about Apollos. You, you remember Apollos? And I talked about how Apollos was mighty in Scripture, um, and he refuted the Jews and that publicly showing from the scriptures that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. And I talked about how he did that having only the baptism of John, that he hadn't entered into the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so Aquila and Priscilla, uh, two apostolic partners of Paul, came along and took Apollos aside and they explained to him, they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So Apollos had to move from just his ability and his capacity and his gifting to, to actually open up the scriptures but he had to move into that that greater grace that comes through the baptism of the holy ghost that greater grace that comes um when when we open ourselves up to the living jesus when we open ourselves up to 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 the holy spirit in truth in truth now not in hype but in truth when we open ourselves up to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, it takes us into a whole other dimension of ministry. And as I was praying about it, God said, you know what, Daryl? This is what the Father said. He said, you know, in some ways, you're a lot like Apollos. You, 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 you have a good handle on the text. You have a good handle 
on the scripture. You have a good handle um, on on sound doctrine. You have a good handle on that. But I want I, I want you to allow me to take you into a place. Y'all hear me? I, I want you. I want you to be able, I want you to be willing to allow me to take you into a place that you grant, you gain a greater understanding of the way of the Lord. Y'all stay with me. I want to take you into a place where you get a greater understanding of the way of the Lord. Now, this doesn't diminish at all um, your your love for sound doctrine, this doesn't diminish your love for the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. It doesn't diminish any of that. This just opens up a different area of ministry that's needed in the body of Christ right now because I'm doing a great work of restoration. Speak, Holy Spirit. I'm doing a great work of restoration, and there are some pieces to the puzzle. There's some pieces to the puzzle that I'm trying to restore back into the life of the church. And so when you talk about this thing of balance between the word and the spirit, you have to be the manifestation. You have to be the demonstration of it, of what it really looks like, because to a large degree, we've seen extremes. We've seen on the one hand, we've seen people who are open to the move of the Spirit. They're open to the Spirit, but they, they, they really don't have a strong doctrinal foundation. They, they really don't have a foundation in the Word. And then on the other hand, we have people who have a strong foundation in the Word, but they're void of the Spirit. And part of what the Father is, is attempting to do in this time of restoration um, is not only did he want to restore to us um, things such as justification by faith. That's not the only thing that the Father was interested in. He just didn't want us to understand um, as, as he brought back um, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit at the turn of the 19th century or the 20th century. And, and so, you know, we open ourselves up to the move of the Spirit of God. And we understood that, yes, God moves. God still fills people with the power of the Holy Ghost. And they still speak in tongues. And, and, and so that became the gateway to the understanding of all of the other manifestations of the Spirit. But that's not all that the father was doing that's not all that the father was doing because there is an absence of an understanding of the work and the person of the lord jesus and this is why to a degree we really don't see the demonstration of the power that is in his name because we have believed if we simply understand the formula of his name then that gives us the the ability to exercise the authority but the authority to exercise the power that's in the name derives from us understanding first of all whose name it is see in christ the whole fullness of the godhead dwells in bodily form and so as god began to reveal his name through the old testament when people had a need and god said i am jehovah jireh i am the lord your provider i am jehovah nisi i am the god that heals you i am jehovah sit canoe i am the lord your righteousness god's nature and character has always been revealed through his name but when god manifested himself in the flesh he said to mary oh my you're going to bring forth a son and you're going to call his name jesus literally you're going to call his name yashua or you're going to call his name yeshua which literally means god is salvation that is the name in which God has revealed himself through the incarnation for the salvation of men and women. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. But the enemy has been quite effective in causing the believers to back up off of the name. 
And since we've backed up off the name, see, the Holy Spirit comes to glorify Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes to glorify the name. And this is one of the things that in the day, in this move of God that we are entering into, in this move of God that we are in, one of the things the Holy Spirit is going to do is the same thing he did in the book of Acts, because as we see the early church moving out in the power, this isn't my message, but as we see the move of God, and as we see the people of God moving out in power under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the thing that we continue to see is that the name of the Lord Jesus was glorified and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. You read through the book of Acts and constantly we see the word of the Lord was magnified and we see the name of of the Lord was magnified and as the Spirit of God is moving in this day he's going to restore a proper understanding of the name of Jesus see we we, we can all talk about God but we need to we, we we need to be definitive of what God we're talking about we are let me get let me get <laughs> let me get to the message because because God get, did give me a word for you all tonight. And, and if I keep going, I'm going to keep flowing. So let's, in John chapter 4, I've been waiting to share this message. But in John chapter 4, we, we have this really interesting story. So I want to read, I want to read a couple of verses. And, and then I want to travel back in time a little bit. But in John chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, it says, When therefore the Pharisees knew that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize but his disciples, he, he left Judea and departed into Galilee. So this is during a time when the, the ministry of Jesus is really beginning to, to pick up some steam. Uh, the notoriety of that had been raised as a result of John the Baptist's ministry was beginning to subside. John had been, of course, put in prison, and John began to point his disciples to Jesus because Jesus was the one who was to come. John confessed and said, I'm just a voice. I'm, that's all I am, I'm, I'm, I'm just a voice. And I think for those of us in ministry, we need to understand tonight, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, that we are just a voice. That's all we are. We're, we're just a voice crying out in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. None of us are those great somebody. So, you know, we can get that out of our mind. You know, we're just a voice crying out in the wilderness, pointing people to the one who can baptize them in the Holy Ghost and, and with power. Mm-hmm. So, in verse 4, it's an interesting statement. He says, he must needs go through Samaria. So, Jesus is leaving from Judea. He's going back into Galilee. And the scripture says, he must needs go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. Now, there were other routes. In fact, for the Jewish people that were traveling from Judea, to Galilee, they would take the extra time and effort to go around Samaria because, well, of course, they didn't want to contaminate themselves. Hey, Minister Child, they didn't want to contaminate themselves with these Samaritans. Are we going to unpack the Samaritans for you tonight? But Jesus, the scripture says, he needed to go through Samaria. He must needs go through Samaria. Samaria. There was a need in the ministry of Jesus. There was a need in the mandate of the Messiah. My God. He needed to go through Samaria because Jesus himself, as the Messiah, was also sent to restore the Samaritans back to a true understanding of the faith of God. Now, y'all stay with me. Y'all stay with me. So, he came to a city of Samaria <laughs> uh, by the name of Sychar. It was near the parcel of ground that Jacob, now I want you to keep Jacob in your mind. 
Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So there came a woman of Samaria to draw some water, and Jesus said unto her, Give me something to drink. His disciples had gone away into the city to buy meat. So the the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, is asking drink of me, which am a woman and a Samaritan? So from the woman's perspective, she had two strikes against her already when it came to the Messiah. Number one, she was a woman. Number one, she was a Samaritan. Samaritan. So she's got two strikes against her. She's of the wrong ethnic group and she's of the wrong sex. See, and women today, glory to God, women today face these same obstacles when it comes to their walk with the Lord Jesus. You all are aware that there are still people who believe God can't use women. Uh, I think you know that. <laughs> right? God can't use women. So that's strike one. Strike two is you might not be of the right ethnic group in order to be used by God. But this isn't my message tonight. I just want to point that out. <laughs> I just want to point that out. But look, so... This woman says, how is it that you being a Jew, you're asking drink of me, which am a Samaritan, a woman of Samaria, because the Jews, now now here's where I want to go, because the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now I want to stop there for a minute and I want to unpack what the problem was with Samaria. Now I'm going to keep going. I'll come back. Verse 10. So Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God. Now, this is what I want you to hone in on, because this is what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about the gift of God. Can you say gift of God? If you knew the gift of God. Now, when we get finished dealing with this, with this Samaritan woman, We're going to look at this gift of God a little different, see, because sometimes because we are divorced, we are separated from a couple thousand years of what's actually taking place in the book. We're a couple thousand years removed from how they understood the story. And so we've kind of made up our own story about what the story is saying. Uh, Y'all with me? So we need to do a little bit of time travel here for a minute. Help us, Holy Spirit. So if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me something to drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. So the woman says to him, you don't have anything to draw with, and the well is deep. So from where are you going to get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? It is verse 12 which reveals to us what the real issue was with the Jews and the Samaritans. So let's take a little time travel here. We all know that the, that the Jewish nation had an issue with the Samaritans. We also are aware that the Samaritans were actually the cousins of the Jewish nation. Now, Think about how many times when Jesus was out ministering, the Jewish people would throw this thing out. They would say, are you greater than our father Abraham? All right. Our father 
Abraham or they would bring up Moses but more to the point they kept talking about their father Abraham because the Jewish nation always connected the promise of the Messiah and the gift of God they always connected it back to their father Abraham are you with me so far this is not what the Samaritan woman brings up she asked the question, are you greater than our father, Jacob? Jacob's well was there. Well, why was Jacob so large in the mind of the Samaritans? See, we've got to ask ourselves some questions. We've got to, we've got to wrestle with the text. <laughs> ah, I told you, I feel... I told y'all I feel Pentecostal tonight. I feel apostolic. Now look, you will remember, I'm not going to read it, but you might want to make a note. If you will go back and read 1 Kings chapter 12. Can somebody type that in? 1 Kings chapter 12 through chapter 16. It will lay out for you what the real problem actually was. 1 Kings chapter 12 through verse 16 or, or, or chapter 16. Here's why. When the nation of Israel was divided upon the death of Solomon. Now y'all need to hear this. Y'all need y'all need to hear this. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make a statement here. I'm going to make a statement here. You will hear many people talk about the kingdom and they will talk about it in terms of Solomon. And they will talk about the greatness of the kingdom under Solomon. No. If we want to understand the greatness of the kingdom, we have to understand the greatness of the kingdom under David. Not Solomon. People say, well, why is that? When you read the end of the life of Solomon, Solomon died in disgrace. It was Solomon who began to bring idolatry into the nation of Israel, the whole nation of Israel. He married all them wives. Y'all remember? <laughs> When Solomon was old, the scripture says, <laughs> his wives turned his heart away, which is exactly what the law of the kings that was given to Moses said. There were three things kings should not do. Now, for you Bible students, that would be a good study for you to do. Go back and find out what God said specifically that kings were not to do. One of the things kings were not to do was to marry foreign women, was to take wives of the nations round about. And God told them prophetically through Moses, if you do, when you are old, they are going to turn your heart away. Solomon did not follow the principles of kingdom. Oh my. Oh my. <laughs> see, see, we have a whole lot of stuff we need to get cleared up. Because a lot of folk running around talking about, well, it's about the kingdom. And, and, and as we listen, we have to ask ourselves, do they really understand the kingdom? Or are they just, you know, repeating some words from a popular preacher that they heard talk about the kingdom? Do they actually understand the kingdom? Now, all right, that was free. When, 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 when Solomon died, the kingdom was actually divided. You remember? Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Rehoboam was Solomon's son. Jeroboam was an Ephraimite, one of his servants, one of his soldiers. And what ended up happening is 10 of the tribes... Um, connected with Rehoboam or Jeroboam and they went north 
two of the tribes remained with Rehoboam, Solomon's son, and they went south. They became the house of Judah. The tribes that went north became known as the house of Israel. So even when, oh my, oh my, even when we're reading the Old Testament, we need to follow the story to know who are the prophets speaking to and what are the prophets saying to that house because not all of the prophets went to the same house there were prophets that were sent to the house of judah and there were prophets that went to the house of israel elijah ministered specifically among the house of israel jeremiah ministered for the most part to the house of judah so when we're reading the prophets we need to know what is being said to each house because it's prophetic about what's going to happen to that house as a result of the coming of messiah do you see why we need the holy ghost to teach us mm, mm, mm. do you see why we need the holy ghost to teach us all right so the house of israel goes under Jeroboam and the scripture says they did this really interesting thing it said that Jeroboam set up houses of worship in the north and he built all of these temples all of these houses of worship in the north I talk about this a lot and then he took and he made priests out of anybody that wanted to be a priest who were not of the house of the Levites of the Levites they were not Levites he took of the basis of the people anybody that wanted to be a priest pretty much under this order that Jeroboam set up could be a priest uh-huh it's kind of like today anybody that wants to go into ministry can pretty much just go into ministry you can order a certificate online call yourself Reverend go open up a little Jack Lake shotgun church you know, put on some robes and all of that stuff like that, sitting around looking like a ghetto pope. <laughs> I'm sorry. I told myself I was going to be nice. But y'all know what I'm talking about. You folks sitting around looking looking like ghetto popes, right? With all, with all of this stuff on, big heavy cross round their neck. <laughs> right? Little, get, little ghetto pope, right? Then they gather around them all their little, you know, whatever but anyway so this is what he did then it says that he went and he set up he set up a day of worship because he didn't want the people to go up to jerusalem to worship because he said if they go up to jerusalem to worship then their heart is going to return back to rehoboam are y'all with me now so he set up a different form of worship for Israel in the north. So what ends up happening is over time, right? Paganism is blended with what little of the covenant they still have. This is what gave rise, my goodness, this is what gave rise to Ahab. Are you listening? How's it going, Brooklyn? This is what gave rise to Ahab and Jezebel was the false worship that had been set up in Samaria in the north. Are, are you with me? Samaria became the capital of the house of Israel in the north. Jerusalem was the capital of the house of Judah in the south. Now, some people say, well, man, it's just too much information. But we need to understand the context so we can understand what's going on with the woman at the well. This is why the story's in the book. This, this is why that's there. This is why Jesus must needs go through Samaria because he had a mission to the Samaritans to restore. Now, watch this word true worship because their worship had become corrupted their worship mm, 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 was a it, it was a mixture it was a mixture of, of of a little bit 
of what God gave and then a whole lot of paganism. And this is what was handed down to the Samaritans from generation to generation. You see? So by the time Jesus came, they were connecting what they thought was true. Watch now. To Jacob, not Isaac, to Jacob, and it's around Jacob's well. So they connected their covenant promises to Jacob's well. They couldn't connect back to Abraham. <laughs> Why? Because they had already diverted from what God gave the whole house of Israel as a proper form of worship. Are you listening? It's, it's a lot like today because a lot of what we have received, Father, give me the grace. Father, give me the grace to say this. Give me the grace. A lot of what we have received as the faith is a mixture. It's a mixture. It's a mixture between some of what Jesus left it's a mixture of what some of what the apostles taught, but there's a whole lot of paganism that has also been brought in. There's a whole lot of other beliefs and other ideas and other philosophies and, and other spiritual principles out of other nations that have blended in with Christianity, and this is what we're calling Christianity. And this is why to a very large, you know, to a degree, this is why we hear so much about, quote unquote, these spiritual principles that God set in the universe, that if we simply use the principles that God set in the universe, then we will receive the blessing of God. Folk, that's not covenant. That's not covenant theology. It's not sound doctrine. That's the same thing that the Greeks believed. That's the same thing that the Romans believed. That's the same thing that all of the philosophers believed, that there were these forces, there were these spiritual laws in the, in, in, in the universe. See, it's all of these spiritual laws in the universe that we as believers need to tap into, and then when we tap into it, then we will experience the blessing of God. Listen to what I'm going to say. God's not a principle. God is a person. <laughs> oh, my. God is a person. Are you listening to me? He's not a principle. He is a person. Okay? Faith comes. Watch this. Here you go. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of God. All right? Faith is a confident trust an assurance in the Father that he is faithful to keep his word. That is all faith is. We have turned faith into a principle and we say God established it in the beginning. So when God spoke, he established this law of faith. No, when God spoke, his word, which is a prophetic word, brought forth what it was God uttered. That's Genesis chapter 1. But we've turned this stuff into all of these principles. And we're trying to operate the faith of God as it's a formula. And then believers can't figure out why it's not working in their life and why they've got to hear this over and over and over and over, year after year after year, book after book, tape after tape. I know what I'm talking about because I went through that. <laughs> I went through that, all right? So I'm not speaking just something I'm kind of making up, right? I'm speaking, I, I'm speaking out of experience, out of research, and out of my relationship with the Lord. I went through that, right? Even the individuals, first generation of, of individuals that begin to speak about faith, were not talking about faith. Listen, they were not talking about faith 
as a formula. That's the second generation. Smith Wigglesworth, Lester Sumrall, some of these individuals, late 1800s, early 1900s, these individuals who, who, who understood what faith was really all about and they lived their lives by faith. Faith is a confident trust, an expectation that God is faithful to do what he said. That's what faith is. Faith is a matter of the heart. Faith is not knowing formulas. Stay with me. But this is what has been passed down to us. And this is what has the church off somewhere where we ought not to be. So we are, um, we are a lot more like the woman at the well than we actually are the disciples of Christ. Because he has to deal with us on the same issue that he had to deal with the woman at Samaria. He has to clear up our understanding, watch, of the nature and the character of of God because we have been we have inherited a religious system from generation to generation to generation to generation that has not met the need of people listen to me listen to me now listen to me if I'm lying or if I'm making something up I want you to ask yourself a question if you've been in your church for five years, six years, seven years, eight years, nine years, ten years, I want to ask you a question. Are you fulfilled in your relationship with the Lord as a result of sitting under the teaching that you're sitting under? Is the word that you're hearing from week to week to week, is it actually nourishing your spirit? Is it actually bringing you into wholeness? Is it actually helping you to learn how to live the life of Christ in the midst of the world? Or do you leave the church empty? See, this is the question. See, listen, the proof of the pudding. <laughs> I used to hear old folks say that. The proof of of the pudding is in the eating. Now, I'm not talking about, mm, mm, mm. yeah, that's why they're church hoppers. I'm not talking about the excitement. Now, watch this. I'm not talking about the excitement from the service. I'm not talking about the excitement that we get when we get around other brothers and sisters and when we get around and, and, and we're praying and we're worshiping and we're doing all of that. I'm not talking about that. That's the same effect you'll have at a football game. That's the same effect you'll have at a sporting event. You get a bunch of people together, there's a lot of energy that's created and everybody gets caught up in the moment. This is what happens a lot of times in many of our churches. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. You get a euphoric experience. If I'm, t if, look, look, if what I'm saying doesn't apply to you, you know, there's an X on the top of this conversation. You can click on out and just say, that brother don't know what he's talking about. But if you are going, mm, 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 if you are going to a church if you are having an experience and you're going from church to church to church to church trying to fill that void trying to to find that place where the presence of the lord is real where the spirit of god is really moving and that word that you've been sitting under that word that you're sitting under there is an anointing upon that word there is an anointing that just doesn't give you a fix for the moment there is an anointing that's working transformation in your life and that word day by day by day is becoming more real you're becoming hungrier and hungrier for more of the word of god you're becoming more hungry you're becoming hungrier you know you you, you have a hunger for the word that just cannot be satisfied there is a hunger for the spirit of god that just cannot be satisfied if that's not how you're leaving your church and you're just getting a fix this is what I'm talking about. 
This is what I'm talking about. This is where the woman was. Now watch this. Let's keep going. So that's where that's where you know that's 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 what happened with the Samaritans. So 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 when Jesus shows up, he's got this whole system of the Samaritans who are still looking. Let me let me keep reading. Let me keep reading. All right. Let me keep reading because I'm getting excited. Where was I? Where'd I leave off? <laughs> Where'd I leave off? All right. Here we go. So 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 she wants to know. Are you greater than our father Jacob? So she connects her faith back to Jacob. So understand that the Samaritans did have a faith. They were not what we would say atheists. They did have a belief, listen, in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They did have a partial understanding of Messiah. They had a partial understanding, but much of what they embraced had been mixed with a whole lot of other stuff. A whole let's call it world religions. Let's call it that. Let's call let's just call it world religions. All right. And so it says, verse 13. She wanna know where you're gonna get this water. So Jesus answered and said unto her, Whoever drinks of this water, they're gonna thirst again. Now watch verse 14. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that i shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life do you do you hear do you hear the master he said listen whoever drinks of that water that natural water you're going to get thirsty again but the water that i'm going to give you the water that i'm offering if you drink this water you'll never thirst because this water will be in you a well of water that springs up into everlasting life so jesus is offering a source of refreshing that never runs dry oh oh holy ghost jesus is offering a source of refreshing that never runs dry. He that believes, if you drink of this water, now we're going to go somewhere in a minute. If you drink of this water, watch, you'll never thirst again because this water will become in you a well of water that springs up into everlasting life. See, what the father is interested in doing, thanks for that super heart, sis. What the father is interested in doing, my God, is bringing us back into relationship with him. I'm going to make a statement here in a minute. The father is interested in bringing us back into a relationship with him so that we have the rivers of living water that's flowing up out of us. This is the basis and this is the real issue of redemption. The real issue of redemption is God restoring us back into relationship with him to get his spirit back on the inside of us. Religion tells us that the issue of, 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 of redemption is God getting you to heaven. Listen, folk, <laughs> if that was the issue, if that were the issue, the wise thing would be this, to get us saved today and then take us to heaven the same day. That creates a whole lot of frustration on me, and I'm sure it would create a whole lot more frustration on the Father as much as I mess up. Are, are you with me? <laughs> are, are you with me? No. See, the whole thing about this now, let me say this. I believe in heaven. I believe in hell. I believe in a renewed earth. I believe. So, so I don't want anybody to say, oh, well, Daryl don't believe that Christians going to heaven. And see, that's what happens when you talk like this. This is what happens when you start really laying out kingdom. Religious minds, which have been indoctrinated with religious teaching, shut down. Soon as they hear something that they've been taught, then they shut down and they really don't hear everything else that you're saying. That's why folk walk in darkness. But another, but that's another message. 
That's another message. See, Jesus said the meek will inherit the earth below. I believe in heaven. And I believe that the redeemed of the Lord, I believe that the redeemed of the Lord will go to heaven. I believe that. I just don't believe, because I haven't found it in the scripture, where heaven is our eternal home. See, if you read the very last book in the, the very last book in the scripture, book of Revelation, John saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down out of heaven. There is a renewed earth. See, God's original plan and purpose from Genesis will be fulfilled. He said, let us make man and let them have dominion over the earth. So when it's all said and done, there is going to be a new earth in which will dwell righteousness are you with me and so even the veil between the heavens and the earth won't be anymore see because the kingdom of god will encompass everything are you with me but what happened is back in the dark ages oh back in the dark ages back in the dark ages a teaching was developed about the saints going to heaven in order to keep the people or in order to in order to encourage the people to give all their money to the church so the church could build all them cathedrals and created this pie in the sky type Christianity and said well listen it's not about your dwelling here it's not about you having nice stuff here it's not about this here it's all about you going to heaven and see 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 so don't get caught up in the world don't get caught up in the system don't get caught up in all of this stuff here in the earth because you are gonna go to heaven because it's in heaven where you're going to get your eternal reward. And the church preached that the whole time they're building cathedrals, the whole time their popes, their bishops, their cardinals, their priests are living in the lap of luxury. They've got the people giving the money, supporting their lifestyle so they could build more buildings. Uh-huh. Ain't nobody mad but the devil. <laughs> Ain't nobody mad but the devil. Are you, are, are you with me? Now remember, now remember, I do believe that there is a heaven. And I do believe there is a hell. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm showing is how a lot of teachings and a lot of doctrines were incorporated into the faith. And they've never been dealt with up until this time. They haven't been dealt with. So let me keep going. So... Whosoever would drink of this water. Now watch this. Here's where it gets interesting. The woman said unto her, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. Now watch Jesus. Now watch the way Jesus shifts this conversation. Let's look at real prophetic ministry for a minute. <laughs> Can I do that? All right. Verse 16. Jesus said unto her, Go call your husband. Now, let me stop here with husbands for a minute. You think about a husband. What does a husband do? A husband pro provides covering. A husband provides protection. A husband provides nourishment. At least that's what they're supposed to do. So Jesus says, go call your husband. And so the woman answered and said, I don't have one. Jesus said, well, you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> let's look at the prophetic for a minute Jesus said well you're right about that you, you, you are definitely right about that because um, you have had five <laughs> and the one that you now have <laughs> he ain't your husband so you did speak the truth when you said that Jesus said, you've had five husbands. And the, the husband that you currently have, he ain't your husband. So you've had five. The one you're currently with, he's not yours, but he makes six. So you've had five husbands. Now, here's something that's interesting. And I'm not saying that this is deep revelation. I just think it's interesting. When you think about this woman and this system of worship that she's under, 
And Jesus begins to speak prophetically. He says, you've had five husbands. Now, what's interesting is what Jesus gave his people were apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We call it the five-fold ministry. So what Jesus gave to cover, if we want to use that word, to nourish to feed, to guide, and to protect. This is what the faith of God has always done. God's leadership has always been in the body to feed and to lead, to guide and protect. But this woman of Samaria has been in all of these adulterous relationships with people trying to get out of this religious system and its leaders nourishment and food and sustenance you've had five husbands because this system that you are involved in it also has a false representation of true ministry see this is what we need to understand that this false system, just like back with Ahab and Jezebel, those false systems have a false representation of what true ministry does. 